Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Leah Edgerton about animal ethics, cognitive biases surrounding animal welfare, and diversity, equity, and inclusion in animal rights advocacy. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that this recording was made while Leah was working at Animal Charity Evaluators, though she now works as a freelance philanthropic advisor. So some of her comments may make better sense if you keep that context in mind. And now here's the conversation between Leah and Spencer. Leah, welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, Spencer. Yeah, so one of the topics I really wanted to talk with you about is how we use reason and evidence to get to the bottom of really thorny, complex questions. And I think you have a especially unique perspective on this uh, as the executive director of Animal Charity Evaluators, because you essentially have to try to sort through all the different complicated reason and evidence on questions around how to help animals and somehow try to get to the bottom of that. Um, which I know know is uh, really difficult. So I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, thanks for asking. So yeah, at ACE or Animal Charity Evaluators, we use evidence and reason to find the most effective ways to help animals. And this can be, you know, we, we try to encap- encapsulate a broad range of, of philosophical views. So this might include people who are working towards animal rights. This might include people who are trying to incorporate animal welfare. So the difference between those would be whether it's acceptable for humans to like have a have a say in, in how animals are treated. So the difference between an animal welfare or an animal rights approach would be whether we're working to um, enable animals to have the most freedoms to do things, whereas animal welfare would be more of a protectivist uh, approach to trying to reduce the harm the animals face. So our work, we try to be encompassing of, of a broad variety of political views, including both of those. And we do research to um, prioritize which types of animals we can help the most effectively with our time and money. And because farmed animals or animals that we eat for food are the uh, highest number of animals raised and killed by humans every year, and we also know of really great ways to help them, and they are currently not being helped as much as we think they could be, a lot of our work focuses on farmed animal advocacy. And as you can imagine, improving the welfare of farmed animals or reducing global meat consumption are really, really complex questions. They relate to people's very personal decisions in their family lives on a day-to-day. They relate to political questions, to economic questions. They tie in with international politics, with economics, with all sorts of other social issues, trade, philosophical differences. And uh, yeah, we end up working with people from all sides of different political spectrums. So yeah, I think this is a topic that tends to, when when approached thoroughly and uh, when approached thoughtfully, sort of lands you in the middle of a lot of really tough questions. And in addition to it being, I think, a very, very complex topic, it's also a fairly relatively new research space. And so in contrast to something like global health and development, there is relatively little evidence available to inform people's decisions. So it's a particularly difficult place to be using evidence and reason to be thinking about the most effective ways to help animals. But that is what we try to do. Yeah, I feel like you're in the middle of so many difficult things because on the one hand, there's a whole huge group of people that says animals, why would you work on helping animals? Like, you know, humans are suffering around the world, right? And so you like, you get the blowback that sort of any animal organization would get. On the other hand, you're at the center of this question of how do we think about helping animals? Do we take this more interventionist approach or do we take this more hands-off approach? And then we we also have this divide between kind of the effective altruist way of viewing the world where you're trying to maximize, you know, the total utility of animals and really optimize, try to really be kind of hard-nosed about, uh, you know, making rigorous arguments and evidence versus a sort of more traditional animal rights approach that has like, just comes at a, from a very different philosophical perspective. Yeah, exactly. And at least in, in my work, and I think many of my colleagues would say they feel the same way, we try to, you know, not be tempted by the simplicity of looking for black and white answers and looking for, um, you know, rejecting completely one framework or completely taking on another. So we try to, you know, when we're trying to use evidence and reason, we are generally trying to 
think of the question of, you know, what can my time or my money, how can we use those resources in order to help animals as effectively as possible? And so I think in that sense, that is, uh, you know, very much in line with the effective altruism framework. You know, there's a lot of questions about like, you know, what is the timeline that we're considering? Are we talking about animals this year or animals in 10 years or animals in a thousand years? And these can give you very different answers. And so that's when we start to use other methodologies between just cost effectiveness. I mean, I think Ultimately, we are working towards a most cost-effective way to help animals, but recognizing that optimizing for that on a one- or five-year timeline can have really negative returns in terms of how that might play out on a 10- or 20- or 100-year timeline. Could you elaborate on that? Where's the tension between focusing on the shorter time horizon versus longer? One pretty clear example would be if you look at some of the common interventions that are used in our space to help animals. So some of the charities that we work with they take on work that is with very short time horizons. So that might be something like influencing corporations to improve their conditions for egg laying hens or chickens raised and killed for meat. And those timelines, uh, we're looking at the animals living on the farms being affected in like the five to 10 year time range, which is pretty short. And we have interventions, like we know that corporate campaigns and corporate outreach can successfully get companies to commit to these improvements and and generally carry them out within those timelines. So that's an intervention where we have pretty high certainty that we can achieve the desired outcome, but the desired outcome is only a very small change in the welfare for the animal. So it might be an animal going from living on a in a cage the size of a, a piece of, of printer paper to, you know, a system where there's maybe no cages, but still very crowded and, and, you know, not very good conditions. So we are fairly certain that we can achieve those types of outcomes, but the, the improvement for the chicken might be very small. Um, and then on the other hand, we're working with charities who are working on either improving the legal protection of animals. For example, some organizations are trying to establish legal personhood for animals, which uh, may take a very long time to achieve may never happen. And it's sort of uncertain what would happen if their campaign was successful. Um, but that's something that we think would have a more transformational approach about how organiz- how our society sees animals and how animals are treated within human systems. And then there's other organizations working on you know, direct anti-speciesism activ- advocacy. So that would be advocacy that's trying to help people understand that uh, animals should be treated with the same moral interest as human for the same types of interests that they have. So yeah, there's a whole whole variety of different types of interventions. And yeah, those are some of the different ways where you can see that the timeline might be very long for something like trying to achieve per- legal personhood for animals or trying to instill anti-speciesist values in a society compared to a five or, or 10 year horizon where we can make a, a small improvement in the uh, well-being of chickens currently living on farms. So because you have so many different stakeholders and so many different perspectives that you have to respond to, I I just want to kind of go through some of them and see kind of what you would say to these different groups. So the first one is, what would you say to people who think to themselves, you know, animal rights, like, you know, why would we focus on that? There's so many different problems that are affecting humans in the world. You know, it just seems like animals shouldn't be as high on the kind of totem pole of concern. Yeah. So we don't, you know, specifically try to have any messaging around, you know, how much of your funds should go towards helping animals versus helping people. We absolutely think that helping reduce human suffering is a a really important thing to do in the world as well. But I think there is also a scientific consensus that animals, at least vertebrates, are conscious and can feel pain and have a sense of self and can suffer. And I think when you consider that, as well as the massive scale of animal suffering happening in the world, whether that's in factory farms or in labs or in zoos and things like that. I think there's a strong moral imperative to address animal suffering as well. Um, And the other thing I would say to to people with that sort of a question would be that um, animal suffering is often very tied to human suffering in the sense that, you know, factory farming, which of course affects billions of, of animals negatively every year, also has negative impacts on humans. It's it's related to climate change. It's related to other sorts of environmental pollution, also related to social, to social problems. Often people working in animal farms or on slaughterhouses are working in very bad conditions. It also infects you know, things like environmental racism and things like this. So yeah, while animal suffering is in itself an important issue, it's also sort of impossible to separate from some of the more important issues faced by humans as well. Now, I think another response that people have is they might say, okay, yeah, I get the idea. Like, we don't want animals to suffer. You know, I don't like the idea of an animal being trapped in a box its entire life. The animal movement is like a huge turnoff. Like, 
you know, just people often think about PETA or they, you know, they just have a sort of negative feeling about animal rights or animal activism. So what would you say to people with that kind of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly understand that you know, not everyone might see themselves in the animal movement. I mean, I certainly didn't. I didn't work in the movement professionally until I got involved with the more effective altruism side of the animal movement. I've been very passionate for, for animal advocacy my whole life. I didn't really see myself working somewhere like PETA or working on campaigns or protests or things like that. That's just not really within my personality. And so I think it's important to understand that, you know, you don't have to be best friends with everyone, you know, out doing street campaigns. It's, it's a moral question. It's a f- philosophical question. And, um, you know, I'm not a philosopher myself, so I don't want to go, go too far in this direction. But there, there's a scientific consensus that, that animals can suffer. And there's, you know, many brilliant philosophers who have done a lot of thinking on this topic, including Peter Singer, who have talked about, you know, the moral importance of of addressing animal suffering, especially on the scale that it is occurring in our world. Yeah. So I think when people think about animal rights movements, they tend to have a very different impression than the way you look at these problems, because often I think a lot of animal rights stuff is born out of like this high level of empathy for animals, um, which, I, which I'm sure that you share. And I, and I also share like, you know, nobody wants to see an animal suffering, but I think that you come at this problem in a different way where rather than saying, okay, these animals are are suffering, like, let me react to the kind of emotion I'm experiencing. You're trying to actually say, okay, if we think about all the different approaches we can take to improving animal lives and we kind of force rank them against each other, which are the ones that seem to alleviate the most suffering per dollar? Is that a fair characterization of how you're trying to think about this? Sort of. So I would say that there are, you know, I certainly meet through through my job people who maybe don't feel a personal connection to animals, um, but understand the philosophical and moral implications of, of animal suffering and want to support animal advocacy for that for that reason. And of course, are then looking for cost effective ways to do so. But I think for myself personally, and for many other people I've met working in this space, it's not that we don't care about the individual animal's well-being. It's that Maybe we care about the individual animal uh, well-being so much that it becomes, you kind of need the tools of, of evidence and reason and scientific method to think about how to approach this in a, in a scientific way. I think for me personally, the reason that I find the effective altruism framework of using evidence and reason to think about how to approach doing the most good for animals I find that personally useful because the individual lives of animals are are so important to me. And I'm someone who's who's very moved by animal suffering on an emotional level. And um, I find this methodology and this approach enables me to, you know, take actions that uh, truly address the problem without being sort of blinded or overwhelmed by the emotional component of, of, you know, the really very real and severe suffering going on. So I find that, you know, as someone who really cares about individual animals' well-being, these methodologies and these frameworks can help me, you know, address the well-being of as many individual animals as possible with the resources that I have. So what is the danger of looking at things from a more emotional lens, right? Like, so you have great empathy for animals, but as you're saying, these tools coming from effective altruism or this way of looking at the problem, you think has benefits. So what is the drawback of kind of letting your emotion guide you more? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, yeah, I I wouldn't really necessarily say the drawback, but of course that you run into cognitive biases. There's a lot of evidence that say that people, you know, react with more empathy to a fundraising campaign that has like one child in, in the ad versus one that has two children. I think humans are relatively insensitive to the scope of suffering. It's just hard for us to emotionally relate differently to the suffering of, say, you know, 100 animals or 100 billion animals. Our brains aren't really built to to handle those numbers and to be able to treat each one of those individuals as mattering as much as, as another one. And so that's why I think these frameworks can be more helpful. And then also in terms of, you know, as someone who works in this space full time for the, my own sustainability, I find it helpful to, you know, look at these, to approach these problems as like a puzzle to solve or to approach them on, on more of a, of a literal level rather than to, you know, think every day about the suffering of every single animal in a, in a factory farm. If I were to, you know, spend all day every day looking at factory farm footage, I would probably not be able to think very clearly about what would be the best way to help improve a lot of animals in society. Like, for example, I think it would make it harder for me to be able to you know, have a civil conversation with someone who eats meat or someone who views the thing differently than me. I think, yeah, I don't really want to like sort of traumatize myself by by looking at the scale of suffering through that lens every day. So using these tools, um, it can help you avoid 
some cognitive biases, but also it can help kind of shield you from the kind of intense emotional impact that might actually be debilitating or, or prevent you from operating effectively. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I would say that's sort of a common observable pattern through a lot of social movements that I've that I've been involved with or observed that um of course I think it's it's important to to understand the scope of the problem and to you know understand the emotional impact on on those that are suffering. But I think there's also a point at which yeah re-traumatizing ourselves can make us worse advocates and can can harm our own mental health in ways that uh you know make our movements less effective over time. It's interesting you say that because my sense is that many more people working in animal rights experience extreme emotional distress around it than people working in poverty. This is just my anecdotal observation. I don't have Mm -hmm. any study to back this up. You know, people working in kind of global health and poverty, you know, they also are dealing with like really sad situations that could be heart wrenching. And yet it seems like they're experiencing less trauma from it. Do you you agree with this at all? I mean, I haven't worked in the in, in, in an organization addressing global poverty, for example. So I'm I'm speaking only from my perspective over here, but I, I do share your perspective. I think that probably comes from uh, the fact that society views these issues differently. I think there are very few people in the world who would disagree that addressing poverty is an important thing or that uh, people who are experiencing poverty matter. I think that's something that, that pretty much all political spectrums and all around the world people would agree on. Whereas in animal advocacy, you might see something really horrific going on and then walk around and, and yeah, at least 95% of the people you meet are, are, are eating animals or who think it's okay to eat animals or um, share wildly different views views to you. So I think it's it's also harder to remain sustainable and to not feel frustrated when not only is the scale of the problem very large, but the recognition of the severity of it in, in the society at large is very low. Yeah, it's such an interesting point because if you're working on global poverty and you tell people about the horrendous conditions, pretty much everyone's going to be like, that's awful. You know, I, you know, that's that's really great that you're working on that. Whereas if you're an animal advocate and you're telling people about how terribly treated the animals that, that other people eat every day are, you'll be ridiculed often. People will dismiss you. People get angry at you, you know, and and if you really take this mindset seriously, I mean, essentially, it's like, imagine there was a factory in your city where they were just murdering people and you were going around being like, look, they're murdering people in that factory and everyone just kind of gets angry at you and ridicules you, right? Like, I mean, that's, it's, there's something extremely upsetting about that. And I think to many animal advocates, that is what they feel. They essentially feel like they're these murder factories and nobody seems to care very much. Yeah, I, I would say that's true. I especially notice that when um, when I talk to people in my field who do undercover investigations. So these are people who either sort of sneak into factory farms and, and take pictures or they get a job as a farm worker and, and take pictures or record videos while they're working. For those people that I've talked to, first of all, like, it seems like all of them really, really suffer a great amount due to the, the burdens of this job. But when I've asked them what specifically about it is so hard for them, they said, of course, it's, it's hard to see the animal suffering in the farms. But what's harder is when they leave the farms and they, they sort of realize that the rest of society views them as, as criminals and, and in a lot of cases felons. I mean, there's a lot of laws against taking pictures or videos of factory farms and, and making that footage available. So, yeah, they said that the hardest part is not necessarily the animal suffering itself, but the fact that they, they come out and, and nobody understands what they've seen or takes it seriously. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So I enjoy visiting farms. I've visited some farms. And unfortunately, I think something that happens is there's an extreme selection bias where the farms that are like, yeah, come visit us are completely different than like your typical farm. Like those are not the farms that produce almost any of the food that people actually consume. So I'm wondering, could you give us a sense of what what is it really like on a typical farm in the United States that people actually are getting their food from? Sure. Um, I'll do my best. I mean, I'm not an investigator myself, but basically animals are are forced to breed and, and, you know, in various ways, in ways that we would view completely unacceptable ways to treat humans or, you know, forcefully inseminated or forced to breed or, you know, tied down to to receive the semen from the, the male animal and um, forced to gestate. And uh, in the case of pigs, for example, they may be um, confined to a cage where they're not allowed to not able to move at all while they're gestating um, and they can develop sores. And of course, it's, it's very, very painful and they're very, very close together and it's, it's very loud and, um, you know, very smelly. And uh, then the babies will be born 
in the case of cows, of course, the babies will be taken away immediately from, from the mothers. Both the babies and the mothers suffer a great deal. In particular, cows are, are very well known for the strong mother-child bond. Um, so that's a great deal of suffering for them. I mean, I, I won't go into detail about all of the horrific practices that there are. There, there's a lot of information on the internet about that. But in general, animals are kept together in very tight conditions. They generally never get to go outside. They're often given antibiotics in order to prevent them from getting sick or dying because the conditions that they're living in are, are so filthy. And the animals are, are um, either bred to grow very, very quickly or given growth hormones to grow very, very quickly. Um, and they're usually slaughtered while they're still technically children, um, so before their reproductive maturity. Uh, so yeah, their lives tend to be very short, full of a lot of suffering, and um, usually end in a in some sort of very painful death. So again, don't don't quote me these statistics. Please look them up yourself. But well over say ninety or ninety five percent of the meat served in at least in North America and Western Europe comes from conditions like these. So unless you're you know specifically going to an organic farm or specifically going to a butcher that you you know sources meat from somewhere else and it's probably likely to be much more expensive you can be quite certain that the meat you're getting in any restaurant or any supermarket comes from conditions like those mm -hmm. so i ran a survey asking people in the us their thoughts about the suffering of animals farming of animals and so on and what i was interested in examining is sort of this tension that it seems like lots of people like don't want animals to suffer like if you ask them they'll be like yeah of course i don't want animals to suffer and yet people you know buy animal products and so i was just curious about that sort of dissonance right where does that disconnect between those two things and so in this survey i asked people do you think it's bad for animals to suffer? And, you know, the vast majority of them said, yes, it's bad for animals to suffer. Okay. Do you think it's bad to make farm animals suffer? And the vast majority of them again say yes. Okay. Do you think that animals often suffer on factory farms? Yes. Animals often suffer in factory farms. So, was, you know, okay, where, where is this going to break? Like where, you know, how, how are people going to resolve this distance? And where it started to turn around was a question like, do you believe that the animals suffered that you actually ended up buying the products from, right? So the products you bought, do you think that those animals were suffering? And a lot of people said, no, they didn't. They thought that those animals were well-treated. So what I started to think is that that's the way that a lot of people resolve the dissonance. It's like, they don't want animals to suffer. They don't want farmed animals to suffer. They do think that farmed animals often suffer, but somehow they think that the animal products they're buying are from better farms that are not mistreating the animals. And, you know, so that's okay. So I'm just curious to hear your reaction to that. Yeah, I think certainly people, I mean, I, I agree that the research seems to point that most people do care about animals. Most people don't want animals to suffer. Um, and yet most people do purchase and consume animal products for food. And yeah, of course, there's there's some sort of cognitive biases going on there that, you know, at some point they have to tell themselves that they're not responsible for the situation. But what I would say is, you know, what I mentioned earlier about the the, the lives that these animals lead of course, there are instances of direct abuse where, where farm workers occasionally feed an animal or do something that is illegal in, in modern farming practices and really you know, do something that is on purpose cruel, that is not part of, of what's necessary to raise and kill these animals for food. But I, I would challenge people to think, that, to think about the fact that you know, all the suffering that I described earlier is not random cases where one farm worker sort of goes rogue. These are sort of built into how these animals are raised and killed and and there is no exception um, in a farm like that, that of how the animals are bred, how long they live, how they're slaughtered. Those are standard farming practices. And I, I think most people would view those as unacceptable. We're not just talking about like random cases of breakout cruelty or breakout abuse. Um, so I think, yeah, that's kind of the message that, that I think is, is really important for people to hear. The other day, I happened to be talking to someone who has spent a lot of her life on a dairy farm. And so I was just asking her some questions about this, about how she thinks about, you know, the well-being of animals. And she was arguing that actually the dairy cows live quite good lives. They have outdoor access. You know, they get to choose what other cows they hang out with. And so one thing I wanted to ask you about that is, do you think that she's probably misleading herself in some way? Or would you say that there's actually just extreme differences in the ways that different animals are raised? I think there are extreme differences um, in the case of a dairy farm, I mean, I, I would maybe ask her what, what happens to the baby cows. I mean, they, they must be separated from their mothers in order for the milk to be consumed by humans. Um, and usually those babies are, you know, either if they're female, they turn into dairy cows themselves or they're killed at a young age and consumed for a veal. 
Um, so I think that's, yeah, again, even if you might be treating those cows well, there's still this, this fundamental fact that cows produce milk for their children. But yeah, I think there are vast differences in how animals are raised and killed. And to be quite honest, I don't have, uh, you know, the answers to what is exactly the optimal relationship that humans should have to animals. Is it, you know, is it okay for us to have animals living in our homes as companions? Is it okay for us to take care of animals in the wild that are suffering? Or should we have a very, you know, separate relationship between humans and non-human animals? Personally, I don't feel qualified to comment on that question. I also would say that because of where where we're starting at as a society with such institutionalized cruelty happening to animals and where we, we're growing up with such intense cognitive biases towards animals, I would doubt that any human alive today would be like sort of unbiased enough to, to be able to take that question seriously. And so for my personal advocacy, I try to focus on, on the questions that really are clear. And to me, factory farming is one of them where, um, you know, basically nobody thinks this is okay. Um, and it's suffering on a massive scale. And, you know, I think once we can start to to undo some of these cognitive biases, and factory farming is, I think, a particularly important one because uh, it relates to people's food choices every day. If people were to no longer be consuming animal products or at least factory farmed animal products every day, uh, and, you know, people didn't have to sort of justify their own behavior or rationalize their own behavior, then we could start to have more in-depth and more nuanced conversations about the optimal relationship between humans and animals and um, you know, is it okay for humans to ever have animals in captivity or not? So suppose that someone thinks, you know, I don't feel good about contributing to animal suffering, but, you know, realistically, I'm probably not going to stop eating all animal products. I want to kind of think about this from, a, you know, an evidence-based perspective, the 80-20 solution where they can make some simple changes in their lifestyle that will have a disproportionately large impact, even if they're not ready to give up animal products. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are just uh, yeah, some of my personal views. I, I personally choose to follow a vegan lifestyle because of these moral questions. But I do know other people who, for example, feel comfortable consuming dairy products, not because they think the conditions on dairy farms are okay, but because each individual cow can produce so much milk that the number of individual animals affected is much lower than if you were, say, to eat fish um, or eat chickens. Um, if you eat smaller animals, of course... To have the same amount of meat, you have to kill more individuals. So yeah, there are some people who say, you know, eating larger animals is better. But then I also want to point out that that conflicts with um, a lot of climate advocacy recommendations that, you know, eating ruminants is, is much worse for the CO2 production. So there's a lot of trade-offs to think about. And the other thing I would point out is that there's really a lot of quite excellent alternatives coming out that, that this really wasn't the case when I went vegan uh, 15 years ago, but there's really much more affordable and much tastier alternatives to, to most animal products and they're, they're much more easily available. And uh, yeah, I would encourage people to, you know, at least try mixing those in as an option here and there and, and figuring out, you know, which recipes those work well with and which cases they don't. And yeah, I think that there's a lot of in-between options and I certainly wouldn't want to some, tell someone that they can't you know, take steps to improve the lives of animals, even if they're not ready to, you know, go vegan or something like that. I think there's there's a lot that people can do. I think it's, um, you know, not advisable as a movement for us to become one where people can only be involved or accepted or their opinions count unless they're vegan. Whether you're a marketing manager, a product engineer, a CEO, a researcher, or a social scientist, you sometimes need to know what lots of people think about a thing, or you might want to have people enroll in a study or experiment. But recruiting study participants can be time-consuming, error-prone, and expensive. Well, good news. Posit.ly is here to help. Posit.ly addresses the common pain points that researchers encounter when recruiting study participants. It aims to solve common research problems and dramatically improve the speed, quality, and affordability of human subject research. With Posit.ly, Researchers, marketers, and product developers are empowered to produce better results by accessing high-quality participants through an easy-to-use web interface, making it easy to run surveys on thousands of people in mere hours, and it can now be used to recruit people in over a hundred different countries. To learn more and to give your research project superpowers, visit Posit.ly.com. That's P-O-S-I-T-L-Y dot com. There's an article that Julia Galef wrote back in 2011 
that has some interesting statistics on the number of calories per life for different animals. And so I'll just read a few numbers from that because I think it's quite instructive. So uh, a chicken, according to these figures, produces about 3000 calories per life, whereas a dairy cow is it's about 17 million calories per life. And so if you think about that, if you're eating the same number of calories of chicken meat versus milk, that's a huge ratio in terms of the you know, your actions lead to the deaths of many, many more chickens than, than a dairy cow. So that's one way of looking at it. As you point out, you know, maybe from an environmental perspective, the analysis is different. I haven't seen good figures on kind of analyzing each animal product, but my opinion, which is uh, definitely less informed than yours on this is that reducing chicken consumption could be a good low hanging fruit way to cause less suffering. I'm, I'm curious if you agree with that. Yeah, I think chicken and fish both. I mean, fish, of course, they're some of them can be quite small animals like sardines or even, you know, salmons are not as large as cows. But the other thing that makes fish especially so high, that makes it especially um, negative for animals is that most of the fish we eat are themselves carnivores. And so uh, they're fed feeder fish. So if you're eating a salmon, um, you know, that salmon in, in a farm would have been eating many, many smaller fish over the course of its life to, to gain the weight to be slaughtered to be eaten for humans. So there's a lot of... Uh, fish lives that go into producing one fish for, for human consumption. The question about fish is interesting because I feel like people, as much difficulty as some people have, you know, connecting with the cause of animal welfare, I feel like they find it even more difficult to connect with fish welfare in particular. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that does seem to be the case. Actually, from from my own personal experience, it was kind of backwards. Um, fish was actually the first animal product that I stopped eating I have a fun little anecdote that I could share if that's if that's interesting about, you know, how I got to that decision. Yeah, please. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I lived in a small village in Switzerland and I had uh, at home some guppies living in a fish tank. Those are little fish. Uh, they're quite colorful and they all look a little bit different. So um, I had like a book where I would draw them all. You know, I was maybe six or seven years old and I, I knew them all. I had that they all had names and sometimes they would breed and there would be babies and then I'd name the new ones. And so I had you know a very close relationship with these fish. I was very interested in their lives. And um, one day our village had a fishing competition. We had a little pond that they had stocked with trout and uh, everyone in the village was invited to come and fish. And I was really, really excited because I was like, this is so great. You know, I love fish. This is going to be all my friends and all my family. We're going to have a wonderful time. And we got there and um, everyone I knew was there, you know, my teacher, my neighbors, my parents. And I was given a fishing pole and I, I put it into the pond. I was, each showed how to fish. I think there was maybe a worm at the end of it. And at some point I felt a tug and I pulled the fish in and I, and I held it in my arms and I was like, look, I got a fish. Really, really excited. And then my father handed me a stick and told me, okay, now beat it to death. And I was so shocked. <laughs> I did not, for some reason, I did not know that fishing day meant a killing fish day. I thought that it was just, you know, we're all going to get together and just sort of admire some fish. Uh, and then I, I just remember looking around and seeing my teacher beating a fish to death and my neighbors beating fish to death and my friends and sort of, you know, the world sort of going black and you know, my vision got very, very narrowed. And I think I just, you know, sort of cried and went home and was very upset when my parents later ate the fish. And uh, that was the point where they told me, OK, you don't have to eat fish anymore. And so that was the yeah, I haven't eaten fish fish since that day. It's so interesting because I think some people they are going to hear that story. And they're going to be like, wow, that must be so traumatizing, right? It's like, you know, imagine you know, if you, you flip it around, imagine that you've got a pet dog, you know, and you love this dog. And then one day your parents are like, oh, here's what we're having for dinner. Fluffy, your dog. And you're like, you know what I mean? Like if you put it in that mindset, that's like so traumatizing, right? On the other hand, some people be like, are you kidding me? Fish? Like, of course we eat fish, you know, we, you're, you're so, you know, like, you know, why would you care, you care about the fish? You know, and I think it just depends so much on how we're socialized around these things, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's also, there are parts of the world where it's totally normal for people to eat dogs and there's parts of the world where it's like not at all normal to eat cows. It really depends on, on how you're socialized. For anyone who's particularly interested in fish, I, I recommend a, a cool book by Jonathan Balcombe called What a Fish Knows. Um, because yeah, I think, you know, obviously we're land animals, fish are water animals. We don't really run into each other on a daily basis. So it's, it's harder for us to know what their lives are like and, and what they're doing, what their personalities and their needs are. And fish also aren't, you know, a monolith. There are thousands of different species with completely different capabilities and, you know, experiences. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot to to learn there. But yeah, there's there's a lot of fast, fascinating information about the, you know, social lives, emotional lives of fish. There's a lot that we can learn, even if we don't get to uh, run into them too often in our daily lives. 
Yeah, and I think this is an interesting illustration of the idea that things that are different from us, we tend to treat very differently, right? Like there's some sense in which fish feel much more different than us than like a dog, that they just feel more alien. And so we kind of, you know, speaking of kind of biases humans have, like, first of all, it's like harder to empathize with them or relate to them. And second of all, because they're so different from us, we lump them all together, right? Like fish are just insanely diverse. Like it's an entire yeah. <laughs> class of creatures. That's like saying, oh, mammals are all the same. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm, um, yet, mm-hmm. yet our brains kind of want to do that and say, these things are all, all like each other. Yeah, definitely. I think there's, there's a lot of understandable reasons why we've developed the relationship that we have with animals, but I think it's also a good time for us, you know, especially living in a world in a time where where there are great and healthy alternatives to eating animal products that I think it's time to to think about you know these moral questions now that we have the ability to do so and uh, yeah to to be more deliberate about yeah how we interact with with other beings on this planet another question one could ask about the different animals in factory farms is which of their lives are like particularly bad and I'm just wondering if you have a perspective on like which are the kind of more mistreated animals? I would guess that farmed fish have the lowest welfare of all farmed animals. And I would guess that cows raised and killed for meat have the highest welfare. They generally live a lot of their lives outside grazing, and then they usually spend some amount of time towards the end of their lives and in worse conditions and feedlots. So those are kind of the two extremes. Yeah, chickens and fish probably have the worst lives maybe dairy cows and um, but certainly cows raised and killed for meat seems to ha- seem to live better lives. The other suggestion I've heard, although I, I haven't really explored this much myself, but some people have recommended consuming animals that are not commonly consumed, like bison or water buffalo or ducks or something because they aren't generally factory farmed in the same way, like that we might not have the same breeds, the same problem where, where breeds are um, developed that are particularly low welfare. And they're probably not consumed at a high enough scale that there's sort of whole industrial systems built around um, raising and killing them. Where would you put uh, egg laying hens on that uh, mystery there? I would put them towards the bottom, similar to fish and, and um, chickens raised and killed for meat. Yeah, there's there's some different trade-offs. Like egg laying hens live a lot longer than farmed fish or chickens raised and killed for meat because they're kept alive as long as they can keep producing eggs at a high enough rate, which is... I think somewhere between one and a half and two years, whereas chickens raised and killed for meat are usually killed at about 42 days. Got it. So that actually pushes towards the the heuristic of like chickens produce a lot less calories per life. And they also tend to be extremely mistreated, you know, on on the spectrum of like how mistreated animals are. So that's sort of another maybe um, argument against eating chicken. Yeah, Spencer, since I know you have a lot of um, experience developing rationality techniques and uh, talking about how people can become more aware of their cognitive biases, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about the cognitive biases that might be at play when we're talking about how humans think about animal suffering. Yeah, sure. So I think that there's quite a few things going on. You know, it is plausible that someone just doesn't care about animals and someone could not care about humans as well, right? If someone says to you, oh yeah, like I actually don't care about what happens to humans. It's hard to say that they're like making a logical mistake. Like that person might be a bad person. Um, you might not want to associate with that person. You know, you might be nervous about their, be- you know, what, what that might lead to in terms of their behavior, but it's hard to say they're making a logical mistake. But I think that that's not the situation we're in for most people. I think that the vast majority of humans do care about the well-being of other humans. And also I think the vast majority of humans do care about the well-being of animals. And I think we can see this if we just look at people's behavior, let's say around a dog that's being kicked, right? If you're walking on the street and you see someone kicking their dog, I think the vast majority of people will be like, there's something wrong with that. That's that's not right. You, you might even feel an impulse to try, try to stop that person, even though you know, you're not going to directly benefit by trying to stop that person. You, you, know, you just feel immoral what they're doing. And so because we're in that situation where the vast majority of people like have some sense that like we shouldn't mistreat animals, then you can start talking about, well, are there kind of systematic biases that are actually causing us to kind of not see the situation as it really is? And, you know, we've talked about one of those, which is the, sort of the difficulty of empathizing with certain animals, right? Like, and there's this, this kind of insanely accurate, simple heuristic about human morality, which is the more different from us something looks, the less likely we are to treat it fairly or be able to kind of view it as a moral agent. And it's kind of insane how accurate this is as a model of a lot of human morality. For example, 
most people, they empathize the most with themselves <laughs> and they care most about sort of how they are treated, right? Uh, the being that's most like you is yourself. And then, you know, that, okay, who do, who do people care about the next most? Well, it's often the, their family, which also looks extremely like them, right? And then after that, it's probably, you know, their friends who often, you know, also look quite like them. And then after that, maybe their neighbors. And after that, maybe people of their country. And then after that, maybe people of nearby countries and so on. You kind of go down the chain until eventually you get to, you know, mammals, and then you get to, you know, things like birds, and then you get to things like fish, and then finally insects. And so I think that one of the biases we have is, that we just tend to evaluate things based on the way they look and and based on uh, how similar they are to us, that this is actually an extreme bias we have towards sort of the, the way we treat others morally. Yeah. And I think there's even some further um, evidence that, you know, besides animals just being different from us, there have been a few studies around human perceptions of animals that we eat. And the research uh, seems to point towards that when people hear or learn that an animal is edible, they view that animal as like having lower moral status, being less capable of suffering and just like being yeah less worthy of protection. So I think there's also a layer that's going on that, you know, has to do with the fact that because most people are, are consuming animal products and they were raised to consume animal products, yeah, there's an additional layer of bias that sort of is trying to rationalize our own behavior. Um, and I think that most people would be grateful to live in a society where they don't need to rationalize these these choices all the time and where there's a food system in place that they that they can easily use and and you know live rich and full lives with with delicious food and all the family traditions that go with it but that doesn't go against their their basic morals that um you know about animal suffering yeah there's this really interesting thing that i've seen happen quite a few times where a young child cares a lot about animals. Like oftentimes children love animals. Like they read a lot of books about animals and so on. And this is similar to, to your story. And then at some point, there's this moment of realization that they're being fed animals and they kind of have this like moment of like extreme dissonance. Um, I remember uh, this happened to one of my family members where they loved fish sticks. Like it was one of their favorite foods. And I remember one day they learned that fish sticks are fish. Like they never had put it together. Like, you know, you sound <laughs> silly, but you know, they're a little child, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they're yeah, like, wait, I I'm well. eating fish? Like what? <laughs> this doesn't look like fish. And it was like very upsetting, right? And then there's this like extreme dissonance that occurs. Like, what? I love these things. Why would I eat them? That doesn't make any sense. And then very often what happens is the parents with people around are like, no, 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 it's fine. It's all good. Don't worry. It's This is normal. And and then the kid gets over it and they stop ever thinking about it again, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think a, a lot of this is social. Like imagine that instead the parents freak out. They're like, you ate fish. Oh my gosh, the fish are, you know, are living <laughs> beings that can suffer, right? Like that would be just completely 180, you know, in terms of, of how people would, would respond to all this stuff. And I think it's a, a reasonable approximation to say that humans can almost never believe that they're sort of actively constantly engaging in immoral actions. Like they need to find some way to kind of deal with that dissonance, right? Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you take that as sort of a, you know, approximately true that like we can't believe that we're constantly engaging in moral actions, that implies that on a psychological level, we have to find some way to be okay with what we're doing or we need to stop doing the thing, right? And like occasionally people do stop doing the thing, like they'll stop eating meat um, or stop buying animal products, but more often they find a way to think about it that makes them feel okay. I've seen so many like smart people say kind of like interesting things about, about why they eat animals that like, I, I feel like they wouldn't use these arguments in a lot of other situations, but there's something about the need to feel okay with it immediately. Like, uh, okay, here, here's some examples of things I've heard people say, oh, well, the animal would eat me, so I'm going to eat it. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. You think a cow or a chicken would eat you? I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> or, well, you know, the animal's already dead, so I'm not really doing anything. And it's like, oh, okay. So you don't think that like by buying animal products throughout your life, you like increase the, the number of animals produced? Um, you know, or yeah, I just, I've just heard so many things that like don't really stand up to scrutiny, like just even like a moment of thinking about it. My personal view on these kinds of things is that there's like many approaches you can have in your life to try to make the world better. And so if like someone is working on, you know, trying to help the world in a particular way, you know, I get that, that people have like limited resources mentally and cognitively and so on. So personally, like I, I I'm not, you know, I, I try not to be judgmental if people are trying to help the world one way and that, you know, other people say they're failing in another way. But I do think it's really interesting how most people seem to be unable to both simultaneously believe that like it's really wrong to hurt animals and also to hurt them. And that leads to this sort of like 
immediate reaction where you try to justify the behavior. Yeah, I think an important part of effective advocacy is to kind of yeah start from the point of commonality that not nobody, but most people don't want animals to suffer in the way that they're suffering. There's a there's an old um, Aziz Ansari comedy bit about chickens raised and killed for eggs, and he just says, you know, nobody would check yes if if you know if your if your choice was like, oh, you know, do you want like animals to be bred in tiny cages and then like the male chicks get ground up alive after a few hours of age and you know they're you know pump full of hormones and this tiny like nobody would check yes like nobody it was never one person's idea to implement the system. It's just sort of arose through a series of like very complex economical dynamics. And uh, I think most people yeah, would prefer that we find uh, a way to live that doesn't require us to have all these rationalizations and cognitive biases to overcome what is, to most people is a pretty fundamental moral value. Yeah, it's really interesting to imagine some future world where the default is that you have access to all of these delicious products that taste just like meat, but we're not made using animals, right? Or we're made using animals like a really long time ago. And now we don't need animals anymore. Something like that, right? Let's like, mm-hmm. you know, cultured meat. And so people are born into this world and then they have to choose, do you go eat the animal products of animals bred in factory farms, which is not the default, which is like a fringe thing to do, you know, or do you just keep eating the equally delicious ones that don't involve an animal suffering? Like, it just feels like virtually everyone is going to choose the like no animal suffering one, right? Like, yeah. you know, if that if that's the default, if that's normal, if they taste just as good, if they're just as cheap, like why would you ever go eat the ones from factory farms, right? But we grew up in a world that's the reverse of that, where like everything is, is you know, the normal thing, the, the, you know, the cheapest thing, the most convenient thing, the one our friends and family do and so on is like, is the one that involves animal suffering. And so it's kind of a sad state of affairs where people are thrust into this sort of moral situation where all the forces are pushing them to do this thing that actually involves creating more suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting time to be alive. I think, yeah. So my, I live in Berlin, which is a very vegan friendly and very animal friendly city. And, you know, my supermarket around the corner does have great cheap alternatives to animal products also made often by the same producers as the animal products and usually advertised for the same price and, you know, at the same shop. So we're, we're getting there. And uh, yeah, I always, whenever I travel, I like to kind of just take an assessment of what's the status of the vegan revolution in this town, for, you know, when I've been visiting the supermarkets. Um, there's also a really fun film I wanted to mention. Um, it's produced by the BBC by a director named Simon Amstel, and it's called Carnage. And it's a, it's a pretty fun thought experiment. It's, it's filmed like starting in, the, uh, in 2067, which they say is, you know, after the vegan revolution. And uh, they have these kids who are, who are alive and they're all, you know, sort of, pan-racial, pan-sexual, sort of a play on, on sort of how we see millennials and Gen Z going in a d- different direction from older adults alive now. And then they sort of learn that their their grandparents used to eat meat and, and they sort of fall out with them. And then there's sort of goes back in time and it it's a mockumentary about how we got from where we are today to the vegan revolution. And it actually starts in 1945, which is that when the UK Vegan Society was founded. And all of the events that go through 2016 when the film were made are, are true events. Um, and they take like true advertisements and true, you know, interviews with vegans and with meat eaters. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty funny and it shows a really, really good perspective on how, how we're going to look back on these values very differently and, and what types of, you know, changes and what, what might society go through in order to get to that point. It's also very funny. So it's, it's a, yeah, that's the only uh, vegan activist film I know that is truly funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is really amazing the progress we're seeing. I mean, now I live in Manhattan and you know, you go to restaurants and there's like a you know 50% chance that they either have an impossible burger or beyond burger. It's kind of okay, maybe that's a <laughs> that's slight funny. exaggeration, but it, it's kind of amazing how common they're getting. They taste really good. They're probably a bit more expensive than normal burgers still at this point, but you know, the prices keep coming down. I mean, one of the really interesting things about impossible burger and beyond burger is that they're technologies. And so over time, they get the benefit of like economies of scale and enhanced technology that makes them taste even better, makes them cheaper to produce, makes them more and more similar to the taste of animal products, right? Whereas like regular animal production has been, you know, it's very far out on that technology curve where it's like, if it's improving in any of these dimensions, taste, cheapness, health, it's a, it's quite slow, right? Whereas, you, you know, Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger, they're just kind of on this really fast exponential curve. And then uh, even more so for things like lab-grown animal products where you start with the animal cells and you try to produce like actual meat without involving animals in the process, except 
to that initial sampling of the cells. Those, I mean, they're not available for, for purchase really, but as far as I can tell, that technology is just going really, really fast on this exponential curve. Do you have any uh, thoughts you want to share about those? Yeah, last summer I actually tried um, uh, the first. I think it's uh, the first like cellular agriculture product that I've ever had, which was the perfect oh, wow. day um, ice cream. And um, I was I was able to buy it in San Francisco at an ice cream shop, and uh, it's made using casein, which is like the pro they, they sort of developed it in a lab. And yeah, it tasted very very different from uh, any vegan ice cream I've ever had. And it was very delicious and creamy. I, I definitely recommend it. You know, so we we talk about. I think there's a sort of a perception that animal-free diets can be restrictive. You know, maybe you're just eating vegetables or, you know, tofu or something like that. But as, as you mentioned, with things like lab-grown meat, you know, there's actually going to be, once you start, you know, designing the the fat and protein and fiber content of a meat, there's there's actually a lot more variables to play with. And, and you know, we could be making food that is even more tastier, that has really different properties for me. There's going to be a lot more options that, you know, we might look at one day and see that the the meat that you can get from animals is just sort of limiting in terms of, of the flavor profiles that you're looking for that, or the environmental properties that you're looking for or, or, or otherwise or health. Yeah. Like they can tune the kind of nutritional content. It's a really interesting point. I mean, one day we might get to the point where the lab grown meat or the plant-based meat is tastier, healthier, cheaper. And then what's going to happen in the meat market? I mean, I would predict in that case that meat would really be majorly on the decline and we'll end up with like a really different world. Like if it's really truly in your own personal incentive, like to eat products that are not made with any suffering, like in other words, even if you're completely selfish, you're better off choosing the plant-based or, or uh, clean meat products. And I mean, I think the world is going to rapidly shift. I sure hope so. So an another topic related to all of this that I just wanted to ask you about a little bit is sort of any tension kind of you see between this kind of effective altruist way of viewing, trying to solve problems in the world and sort of other perspectives from like, let's say social justice. And I think this is like particularly interesting in the animal space. It's a, such a intersection between these ways of viewing things, right? Like there's these two very different perspectives on how to make the world better. And I'm wondering how you navigate that. And I imagine you probably face pretty intense pressures on, on both sides uh, from effective altruists and also from social justice advocates who both really care about your work and, and um, you know, how you're doing it. Yeah, definitely. And I think, yes, yeah, certainly we, we see that in the animal advocacy and, and especially, you know, at ACE where I work, um, which is at the intersection of the effective altruist community and the animal advocacy community. But I also think this reflects sort of a, a broader political and social trend that, that I see in certainly in North America and in Europe where I live. You know, I think we're we're definitely feeling those effects here, but I think it's it's not sort of unique to to our space. Yeah, certainly we do feel a lot of pressure from all sides to sort of take on one framework completely or reject another framework completely. And we try to just be comfortable with sort of sitting in the gray area in the middle and recognizing that truth seeking can be done in many different ways and that there's sort of pros and cons to different approaches to truth seeking. So when we talk about some of the core tensions that we feel between those communities is um, especially around issues around, I would say that the sort of two hot button issues are something around like free speech and open discourse on the one hand and between representation, equity and inclusion or what people might negatively refer to as like PC culture or cancel culture. And I think we try to, yeah, like I mentioned, not not be pressured into to taking one extreme view or another, but to understand that for truth seeking, you know, we both do need open discourse and the space to explore ideas and the space to question the status quo. And we also need to have everyone whose opinions matter about this at the table. So we don't want to be excluding people who who have really valuable perspectives, especially when you're talking about something like animal suffering, that it affects that people in every single country. It affects people from every socio every socioeconomic class, people who identify with different races, with different genders, issues that you can sort of separate or, or address, you know, in one office or one little lab in, in some part of the world. These really require solutions that affect people on, on every different level of the personal and the political and the cultural. So, yeah, those are those are some of the, the main tensions that we feel. And I would say I've personally experienced, you know, a lot of pressure and in some cases quite negative attacks from people on, on sort of both sides of that spectrum who have felt critical about how we've approached, you know, balancing those issues and I think it's really important that we you know, keep thinking critically about the feedback that we're getting from all different sides. But also, as I mentioned, uh, 
I, yeah, I don't want to be tempted by the simplicity of, of fully taking on one view and rejecting another when I think they both bring really important aspects to think about when you're, when you're pursuing truth seeking work. So what's a concrete example where the two sides don't see eye to eye and are kind of pushing in different directions? Yeah, one of the examples would be the extent to which we consider representation, equity, and inclusion in our charity evaluations or in our grant-making decisions. So we think that in order for a charity to be effective, they need to be pursuing effective programs and you're pursuing interventions that are shown by evidence or or that we think uh, reasonably are expected to create a high impact for animals. But we also want to invest in organizations that are good for the long-term development of the movement. You know, as we mentioned, the state of animal suffering is really starting at a a very wide, wide scale. And this is not a problem that's likely to get solved in the next 10 years or or even 100 years. And we want to invest in a movement that can be effective over the long term. And we think that means things like developing good organizational culture, uh, reducing turnover in the movement, and just generally instilling good norms in the movement, whether that's things like open science or impact assessment or, you know, incorporating representation, equity, and inclusion in our work. So we want to, you know, not be actively discriminating against people in our community who care about animals and want to use their time and their resources to help them. So what would you say the steel man arguments are on each each side of this diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation? Yeah, so I would say coming from the um, sort of more free speech side of things, people are saying that All ideas should be open for discussion and we need to be able to have unpopular opinions. I mean, for example, that animal suffering is important and needs to be addressed or that people should reduce animal consumption. That is, for example, an unpopular opinion in the mainstream discourse. And we certainly embrace that opinion. And so, yeah, I think there's there's a thought that we need to be able to think and talk critically about all sorts of different subjects in order to be able to identify, you know, without bias, effective ways to help animals. And then the other side that we hear coming more from those working closer with social justice communities would be that certain types of free speech uh, exclude people from the conversation, whether directly um, by saying, you know, literally people can't come or indirectly by, you know, making an environment so unpleasant that people don't want to enter it. So, for example, I'm a woman working in the animal advocacy space and I might not feel comfortable or not even necessarily uncomfortable, but I might just like not want to spend my time and energy working with a group of men who don't understand that like my opinion counts as much or who want to promote interventions that I think are sexist, like, um, you know, having women walk around, say, naked or with bikinis on promoting, you know, go vegan. It's, you know, sexy or something like this, which you know are real interventions out there that people use to help animals. So, yeah, I think the issue here is that if literally everything is on the table, some people are going to bring ideas to the table that have sexist or racist or ableist or whatever undertones. And then we end up with people with marginalized identities not wanting to participate in the conversation or being deliberately excluded from the conversation. And then we lose out on a lot of valuable insight, especially when a lot of those marginalized populations are extremely important stakeholders when you're talking about animal suffering, since, um, you know, rural communities can be more affected by factory farming in the area, or, for example, women often make food choices for their families um, more so than men. Um, Yeah, there's all sorts of examples around why you might want a diverse set of stakeholders at the table when you're making decisions around the most effective ways to help animals. And so that's sort of the trade-off between Um, You know, how open is the discourse and what types of behavior do we accept from people who are allowed to participate in the conversation? And, you know, how does that affect our ability to, like, speak freely about all the important issues that there are and also include everyone who needs to be included in order for us to arrive at the most truthful outcome? It seems to me that on this topic in particular, almost nobody takes the extreme position. Almost nobody says that, oh, yeah, we should include people in the animal advocacy community that go around talking about how certain groups of people should be murdered or something like this, or, you know, like based on their, you know, race or ethnicity. Like nobody, nobody wants that to be sort of acceptable speech, right? On the flip side, probably nobody's going around saying, oh, you, you, nobody should be allowed to say anything that contradicts my opinion, or everyone should have to agree 100% on, you know, these talking points, or we should kick them out of the community, right? Like, like those two extreme positions are totally untenable. 
So it seems like what is happening is that is we're debating over like where do we draw this line and on the one hand people say okay if we, we really want people to to speak quite openly and to be able to say almost anything because by restricting even kind of minor restrictions on what people talk about uh, might reduce people's ability to kind of think clearly and avoid bias and and get to the truth and on the other hand people say yeah but people are feeling marginalized and we're losing out on people who could be a part of this community and would be really valuable to include, but they don't feel comfortable because of some of the things that people are saying. Like, is that, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I would say that's fair. I think, yeah, certainly nobody seems to take either extreme stance, but people have a lot of different opinions around, you know, what's acceptable in terms of trade-offs in, in those gray areas. Yeah. You know, and I think a, a critique that I've heard, and I'm curious to hear your reaction to it, is that, you know, if you take a, a group like Animal Charity Evaluators, that has the stated mission of trying to help animals as much as possible. I think some people from the kind of effective altruist point of view say, well, yes, it makes sense to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion insofar as it helps with the mission. So insofar as it leads to the organization being more effective at helping animals, which is its mission, but it doesn't make sense to include these initiatives insofar as they're aiming at something else, like insofar as they're aiming at other social goals, because while that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It's just not the mission of animal charity evaluators. In other words, there can be other organizations that have that mission, but it's sort of like mission creep, essentially, that it's it's adding this other element on that's not the the state of mission of the organization. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think there are, you know, many, of course, we all hold like our individual political or or moral views on, on other social issues. And, you know, we encourage or or allow people to do pursue those as they see fit in, in their free time outside of work. But at ACE, of course, our, the scope of our work is, is restricted to, you know, the most effective ways to help animals. And so, so for that reason, of course, we would never like fund, uh, I don't know, a children's literacy organization in India that had like nothing to do with animals, even though like we might all think that, you know, improving literacy of children in India is an important thing to do. But then on the other hand, yeah, we have seen issues, for example, around sexual harassment cause like really, really drastic effectiveness issues within the animal advocacy movement, like in 2017, which was around the same time that the the sort of broader societal Me Too discourse was happening within animal advocacy. There were several leaders of animal advocacy organizations who had been um, exhibiting problematic and harmful behavior towards female colleagues. And those conflicts led to those organizations really having like very serious problems, like a huge amounts of turnover, unable to carry out their programs, um, you know, many, many organ- uh, advocates leaving the movement, um, according to them, forever because of the negative experience. And so I think that's the other extreme as we see, you know, if we don't have any standards on these issues and, and how they affect the effectiveness of the, of the animal advocacy community, we're going to run into like a very unhealthy movement and these types of issues can cause huge problems for the effectiveness of our movement over the longer term. Got it. So it sounds like from your perspective, there are very real trade-offs here where if we don't pay enough attention to some of these issues, it actually reduces the effectiveness. And so even just taking the point of view of how do you help animals the most, which I think is is your goal, we still want to take into account some issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, make sure we're doing a good enough job that's not impairing effectiveness. Yeah, definitely. And There is a little bit of research around this, like Faunalytics, which is one of our standout charities. They've done some research about activist turnover and burnout. And, um, you know, many people have experienced some sort of discrimination in their workplace. And, you know, a lot of people have, there's some evidence, I don't want to quote the exact numbers, but I recommend looking it up, but that these problems are really quite pervasive, especially for non-white advocates, so advocates of the global majority in our space, and also for, for women, um, less so than I think it was before, but still to, to an extent that it deserves some attention. Yeah, we certainly don't want advocates to be leaving our space or unwilling to help, unwilling or unable to continue working in the movement to protect animals because of these external issues. So I think, you know, we're not at ADACE, we don't, we don't view it as our mission to, you know, address these other issues directly, but we certainly don't think it's like an acceptable trade-off to like cause great harm to these other important causes in order to help animals. Or, and we also think of course that those social issues, you know, insofar as we want our organizations to be effective, we want them to be able to hire and retain the best people to do the job. Uh, we don't want them to have like this this bias where they're unable to access large amounts of the talent pool because they're actively being discriminated against within the movement. 
Right. That, that makes sense to me that, that there is a real fundamental trade-off there in terms of reducing efficacy. Though I, I, I feel like there's still a lot of tension potentially between those worldviews. Something I, I've observed is that you know sometimes you see people make arguments about you know uh, diversity, equity, inclusion kind of issues because they care about in their own right. And that's totally fine. And as you point out, that's just not the mission of ACE. And other times you see people, you know, kind of make more effectiveness minded kind of arguments. But something that I think happens is that there's this, this, this cultural difference where some people say, well, really, we should have dual mandates. Like, you know, we should be focused on DEI kind of issues for their own sake, even within an animal rights organization or, or you know, an animal charity. And that, that can create a sort of a like a cultural tension, right? Like going from this idea of like, we have a single mandate to this dual mandate. That just seems really difficult to navigate because people who care about these issues, I think are going to often want to like make them a second mandate at the organization. Yeah. I think it's, that's something that needs to be sort of constantly managed. Um, I mean, again, to um, go back to the example you used of the extremes, I think there's no one who would say that like, you know, we want to recommend the most effective way to help animals, even if that kills people. You know, of course, we all have a line around, you know, what we think is acceptable in terms of how to run an organization and, and what externalities our actions have, which, yeah, might be along moral values that are separate from, from the mission of the organization to reduce animal suffering. But yeah, I think, as I mentioned, these values are intention. And I think that that's Okay, I think they both bring useful and important frameworks to approach the problem, you know, to approach the question of how to help animals as effectively as possible. And uh, yeah, I think it needs to sort of remain, or at least yeah, my my approach as a leader in this space and the person running an organization in this space is to actively manage the balance and try to keep things from moving too far to one side or another, and to you know keep the focus that you know yes, ACE is an organization that is exist to to reduce animal suffering. But as I mentioned, these other social issues have an impact on our ability to reduce animal suffering. And yeah, I think, of course, the society at large is having a, a conversation around how actively do we need to be pursuing other values like anti-racism, for example, to be, you know, just moral humans. And um, one guideline for that could be, you know, just complying with law, which in a lot of the world is you know, is, is maybe a, a good enough barometer that, you know, we shouldn't have sexual harassment, we shouldn't have bullying, we shouldn't have discrimination, we should pay our employees, you know, we can't just fire them with no notice in a lot of different countries. So that that can be some of the guidelines for, for basic ways to run an organization in terms of ethical behavior. But I think, and um, especially when you're considering parts of the world where the laws might be different, there is some amount of responsibility for organizational leaders to make their own decisions around how much of a mandate they they think yeah, they, they have to take these other issue, issues seriously. I wouldn't necessarily say that things like sexual harassment or mistreatment of employees is higher in the animal advocacy communities than it is elsewhere. You know, like these kinds of issues occur in many different industries. But on the other hand, it's not obvious to me that it's less in the animal advocacy community either, which is, you know, insofar as that's true, it's sort of interesting because it seems like this is a movement that attracts like really altruistic people that are trying to improve the world. And so you might think, well, you know, where's the empathy towards your employees? Where's your empathy towards, you know, you know, uh, around issues like sexual harassment. And so like, there is a sort of surprise, I think that I register when you have a group that's, like trying to improve the world. And then you find out that the person running it is harassing their employees or something like this or mistreating them or, uh, and so on. And so just wondering if you have any thoughts about that tension between the sort of like the ethical mission and yet some of these organizations, as, as I know you've uncovered as well, have engaged in unethical behavior that's like not in the animal domain. Yeah, I think um, it might be nice to think that, you know, caring about one social issue means that you're more likely to care about another and maybe it does. But certainly I've witnessed countless experiences um, where being really morally engaged in, in one area doesn't necessarily carry over to values to another area. I think that's just something we need to accept about human psychology that, yeah, I've actually <laughs> had uh, somebody ask me the question before who was um, in the vegan advocacy space and maybe had a little bit of an idealized view of how transformational values towards animals can be towards the rest of the world. They asked me, can you think of a single vegetarian who who's caused a genocide? You know, if we all were vegetarian, we all were compassionate towards animals, we would all naturally be compassionate towards other humans. But I don't know if you're 
if this is jumping right into your head, but it certainly jumped into right into mind that Hitler was a vegetarian and he's like probably the most famous genocide executor that we are aware of in, in Western culture. So I think it's not at all a guarantee that someone will, you know, have good morals in another area just because they, they care about animals. Yeah, it's so interesting because I, I think a lot of people have the intuition that there's sort of like a spectrum of goodness, right? Like some people are better people in a moral sense and some people are worse. And, and that certainly seems to be true to a degree, right? Like, like I can certainly mm -hmm. think of people that I think are just terrible people. And I think they're <laughs> terrible in like every dimension, you know? And then there are people that I'm like, yeah, I, that person would like never hurt anyone. Like that person is just like, that person's good. Uh, you know, you can always trust them. I, I wonder if part of what happens with this stuff is that rationalization thing where humans are so good at rationalizing their behavior. So you can get the situation where someone's, you know, they're not at either extreme. They're not like pure you know, evil and they're not pure good. They're somewhere in the middle as most humans are, and they really care about animals. But on these other domains, you know, they find some way to rationalize their behavior and kind of feel okay about it. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, certainly I'm not an expert on the research in this area, but it seems like values can can come in, in clumps and not necessarily sort of be on a, along a linear a linear progression. And, and when we talk about yeah, moral circle expansion, I think it's important to talk about to, to recognize that yeah, moral circle expansion to like one group really doesn't necessarily have any correlation to like so even even towards one group of animals, you know, people can be very compassionate towards their their cats and their dogs who live in their homes and and then not at all towards towards pigs or chickens living on a fan factory farm. So I think, yeah, it's just and it's just the same when, when we're talking about different groups of humans or humans versus animals, that being moral around one issue doesn't mean that you necessarily have moral beliefs around another issue. If you're like me, you'd really like to learn quick, practical tips for improving your life or understanding the world. But it's hard to know where to look, and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the flood of blogs, media sites, and academic papers. Well, there's good news. Once a week, we send out a newsletter called One Helpful Idea, where we distill down a single idea that we think you'll find to be valuable. We know you're busy, so each idea is formatted to be read in just 30 seconds. And at the bottom of the newsletter, we also include links to that week's new podcast episodes, which is a great way to keep up with the podcast. And we include, in each email, a newly released essay by Spencer. So if you only listen to our podcast, you're missing out on a lot of our content. To sign up for the One Helpful Idea newsletter and start receiving bite-sized ideas once a week, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com slash newsletter. So before we wrap up, I want to move to a related but different topic, which is, I don't know if this has influenced your views on animals or, or your passion for this cause, but I know that the topic of pain is, is like a very personal one for you. And so do you want to tell us a bit about your story with pain? And uh, I'd love to kind of ask you some questions about how you learned to manage it. Yeah. So I've lived with chronic pain since I was 11 years old and um, it got much worse in my early 20s. And uh, yeah, it got to the point where I, I used to be a professional musician. Um, that was my career. And I had to stop playing because of the pain. And yeah, I've had constant chronic pain basically every day of my life since I was 11 years old. So it's something I've had to learn to live with. And I think one of the more yeah sort of interesting life lessons I've, I've taken from it is it sort of relates, I guess, the personal to the political. And I don't have a, a firm takeaway here, but maybe just some observations to share is that one of the ways that I manage my pain is essentially to like not think about it um, or to, to sort of react as, as little as possible to it. So I know there's sort of this Buddhist concept of the second arrow. You know, the first arrow is the one that hurts you. And then the second arrow is the one you shoot at yourself when you sort of have all this resistance and all this upset and this sort of like emotional reaction to the fact that you got shot with the first arrow. So that's sort of how I try to think about my pain. It's like, well, it's it's bad enough that I am in pain, but if I'm also then going to think about like, oh, you know, it's so unfair and I lost all the opportunities and, you know, life is so much harder for me than for others. And I really wish this pain would go away. Then it makes the pain worse, or, or at least it makes my subjective experience of it much worse. Um, and so I think that's been a really important life lesson about how I relate to, you know, other identities that I have and, and also how I think about you know, doing good in the world. I mean, I guess I am disabled in the sense that I have physical things that I cannot do that other people can do, but I don't really 
find it helpful to like frame to myself that I'm disabled. Like I, I try to sort of hold myself to the same standards I would other people. And, um, you know, maybe it's harder for me to sometimes accomplish those things, but I, I think I would suffer more if I sort of didn't pursue things that I wanted to do in life just because I knew that that would be harder for me or because it was unfair that it was going to be more difficult. And yeah, I think that's a sort of an interesting question around, you know, I think a lot of especially social work tries to understand different identities that people have and, you know, sort of understand people's experience of the world according to those identities. And then there's this sort of paradox that the more I identify with, say, an identity that is caused me harm or that makes me marginalized in our society in some ways, the more I suffer from it. And so it's sort of this, this interesting paradox. But on the other hand, I'm, of course, grateful that, you know, other activists have, have thought about disability and have made the world more accessible to me so that I have, you know, health insurance. And when I go work at offices, they, they have to provide a, an ergonomic workstation for me. And, you know, I have medical leave. I have all these benefits because someone has thought, okay, well, disabled people need rights in the world and, and gone and, and worked for those things for me. But then paradoxically for me as an individual, it's, I find it personally harmful to identify in that category because of the way it makes my life, my life more difficult. I think this tension that you're kind of pointing at is such an interesting one where the fact of the matter is that there's so many unfair things that happen to people. There's so many things that people didn't deserve, they're bad, that they have to deal with. And simultaneously, while they could rightfully claim status as a victim, there's something psychologically about thinking of yourself as a victim that can actually make your life significantly harder. If you have a victim mentality, by which I mean you kind of think about, you know, this is unfair, that I didn't deserve this, and that's, your, that's a constant kind of narrative running through your mind, especially if you kind of think, I have no control over this, the world is just doing this to me. Well, you may be completely 100% justified for having those thoughts. It can actually impair your ability to make the best of the situation, to take effective action, to take control of the things you can take control of, even though you can't take control of everything. Do you feel like I've captured fairly what you're saying there? Yeah. Um, you know, there was a point in my my medical treatment where I, and also I was living in the United States where there was there's sort of different laws around disability. And I had the option of sort of being declared by a doctor as unable to work and then getting whatever social services would be available in terms of like housing and money that come along with that. Or if I am able to work full time, I don't qualify for any support. And so I had to sort of choose, like, do I want to take this this path where, um, you know, I know I'm going to have like certain hindrances that will make it harder for me to work full time. It will make it harder for me to pursue a career than other people. Or do I want to take this sort of, you know, route that everyone would have, of course would have understood if I had just said, well, like, look, it's too much and I, I don't want to try this. But I think the person who would have suffered the most would be me. You know, I would be the one who would be for going life experiences. I would be the one who would yeah, be missing out on all these things. And, and certainly it would be justified. But I have personally, you know, the choice that I've made for myself has been to, you know, not identify very much with that. And, and of course, handle the moments where, where the reality comes to face that, that I do have challenges that I face in these areas that other people don't, but sort of handle them at a, at a concrete level and pursue my interests um, regardless. The type of disability that you face is also one that I feel like a lot of people are not going to necessarily recognize or think of because it's sort of not visible, right? Like if if someone talks to you, they just wouldn't realize that you're experiencing this constant pain. And I'm wondering whether that has kind of made it more difficult to live with a disability that nobody can recognize, basically. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you could argue maybe maybe that actually has advantages. Maybe people will discriminate less because they, you know, they don't view you as disabled. But yeah, I'm curious how that's been for you. Yeah, pretty much as you described it. I mean, it's, it's a privilege to have the choice, of course, to decide if I want people to know or not. I mean, of course, I, there are moments where I, I yeah, maybe I'm wearing braces on my arms or you know, maybe I physically can't do a thing that other people are doing and I need to tell people. Or maybe, you know, everyone else is standing up for two hours and I have to be like, hey, sorry, I can't do that. So there are there are moments, you know, even like I'm in a choir and um, I'm the only one who has a music stand because I'm the only one who can't hold my music up in front of me for the whole rehearsal. So, you know, people do know. And there, there are, of course, occasions where I can't hide it. But yeah, I mean, of course, on some level, it's frustrating that people, people often forget um, that I have this ability and, and, you know, say like, hey, you want to play tennis this weekend? It's like, well, <laughs> no, I, I can't. Um, or, you know, friends will all go rock climbing and then it's like, okay, well, you know, have fun. 
but I, yeah, I guess I've just found it more helpful to, you know, of course it's, it's okay to feel disappointed in those moments. It's okay to feel excluded, but to just sort of not let that become something that takes up a lot of real estate in my brain, because it, it's just a, it's something that makes me unhappy. And it's something that makes me miss out on, on all the great things that I can experience and do experience every day. Yeah. I see your point. I mean, they're really, whether it's visible or, or invisible, there's just different things you face, right? If it's invisible, mm-hmm. people forget about it. And they may say insensitive things. If it's visible, people might you know, prejudge you or treat you differently. So yeah, that, it seems like there's, there's no way to win. That's just a different set of negative effects you might have to face. Are you comfortable talking about what it feels like, what your internal kind of experience and quality is on a like kind of a moment to moment, day to day basis? Yeah. So it's changed over the course of my life, but I would say general description is that I have constant burning pain in my hands, forearms, shoulders, and neck. It's constant, so it doesn't really go away. Um, and that's, it's not often severe. It's not often like the same as you would get if like someone was like stabbing you with a knife. Like it's, it's not so so acute, but it's, it's very constant. So it can be draining in that sense. Does it fluctuate in intensity? Yeah, but generally over the course of days rather than the course of like minute to minute or second to second. It sounds just really distracting and unpleasant to live with. So I'm wondering, are you able to kind of forget about it at times or, you know, how do you kind of deal with it kind of moment to moment? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've had it for so long now, more than 20 years that I, I actually do forget about it myself most of the time. And I've been able to, you know, I live in a, lived in the same apartment now for a while. So I have like ergonomic furniture and, you know, it just doesn't, I don't run into situations in my day-to-day life where I'm like reminded of the fact that I can't do certain things, but then the pain itself, I mean, I notice it certainly, especially on bad days, it's, it's sort of, it's impossible to forget, but then, yeah, I would say on, on those days, I sort of just say like, well, okay, then I need to have, you know, different expectations of myself for what I'm going to do, or even, uh, what kind of thoughts might come into my head? Like if I'm in a lot of pain, I, I might also have, you know, bad dreams that night or a lot of negative thoughts that day um, and just sort of approach those challenges with the awareness that like, okay, well, I just need to kind of ignore whatever thoughts come into my head for the next 48 hours or whatever. But um, yeah, I think I am I am quite lucky that I would say it's only maybe in the last four years or so that I've gotten to this point where I, I really do just forget about it for great parts of the day. And is that... Largely by getting into kind of a flow state where you're just so engaged with doing something that it's kind of not in the center of your awareness. Yeah, definitely that. And yeah, I mean, I, I do meditation. I actually find my music practice to be one of the times where I'm like most in flow state and most unaware of it. And then I think the the sort of skills that you develop for flow states and music, they, they sort of carry over to a lot of um, the similar benefits that you might get from from mindfulness practice meditation in other areas. So I think that's that's also something that helps me kind of focus my attention on, on certain things and not others. When you meditate, what kind of meditation do you do for, with regard to the pain? Like, do you actually focus on the feeling of pain or, or are you trying to broaden your focus? It really depends. I find like body scan meditations to be helpful, but then I usually start from my feet to my head because if I start at the top of my body, I start on the pain and that's harder. Um, I actually do notice like a pretty drastic change in, in my ability to be mindful. Like, so if I'm thinking about my feet or my legs, which don't hurt, I'll be able to like really focus on the sensations. And then when I get to the body scan and I get to the upper body, to my arms, my brain will be like, think about anything else. You know, I'll be like, think about the weather, think about what you're having dinner, like think about your cat, you know, just like, it's actually so, so much harder for me to keep my attention on the body parts that feel pain. Mm. So it's like trying to keep your hand on a hot stove. It's just like your yeah, it wants yeah. to withdraw. Yeah. Have you ever been able to, in meditation, get to a state where you're like fully focused on the pain part and able to not suffer? Yeah. So when I first started meditating, my sensation of the pain was higher because I was sort of deliberately trying not to ignore it. And so my subjective experience was like, oh, wow, meditation is making my pain so much worse. But then once I kind of got past that, I got to the point where because I was sort of more mindful of the pain... I could also notice like what I do in life. And for example, in terms of ergonomic or unergonomic movements or in terms of like stressful situations, I would notice like right away when the pain got worse or what was affecting it. So I actually gained the ability to identify what was making it better or worse. Whereas before I, I didn't really have that knowledge. So that's been very helpful. So meditation give you more, more bodily awareness? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. More awareness of, of what um, causes the pain. 
also an ability to just yeah look at it without reacting. Like I think I'm very unreactive to to physical pain in terms of how I, uh, you know, most people are like, oh, I can't believe that you're acting so normal. It's like, well, yeah, I just really cannot. Re- I mean, of, of course, once it's above a certain threshold, it becomes harder. But I've gotten to the point where my threshold is is quite high for being able to just not engage with it or not not resist it. I guess. Does this carry over to other pain? Like, let's say you you know got a back injury temporarily or something like this. Do you feel like you relate to it differently than other people do? Yeah. I mean, I think I relate to it also differently on a physical level. Like my central nervous system is much more sensitive than most people's. So I think my perception of pain is different. Like I I, uh, feel things that might feel minor to other people. I feel them more strongly, but yeah, I have a sort of a separation between like the feeling of the pain and like deciding how I want to react. Like I still have that. If I like stub my toe really hard, I can still sort of Yeah, I have a moment where I can choose how I'm going to react. Right, whereas maybe others are just, they're going to immediately, you know, say, ow, and, you know, Mm -hmm. grab their foot or something. And and you're kind of like used to kind of managing your behavior in light of pain and choosing how you act. Yeah, I even noticed that during like strenuous exercise, like it's just, I can sort of choose whether or not to like, it feels very easy for me to, to, I guess, like push through like very strenuous exercise. I'll be like, oh, this is like very, very physically uncomfortable, but I can just sort of, maybe it's also like, I also have um, a certain amount of ability to like dissociate from my physical body to just like observe it, but just like, well, I'll be back when like, you know, after my 30 minutes on the elliptical is up or whatever. If we view pain as the experience of the kind of physical sensation, the qualia and suffering as this negative mental state, right? The state that that feels bad. Normally, pain and suffering are so connected that like you wouldn't even think to separate them, right? If you feel pain, you suffer. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I've observed and I've also heard other people talk about is that during meditation, you can get glimmers of them separating. Um, so I used to do this kind of meditation just for practice sometimes where I'd go out in the cold without wearing a jacket. And I would try to focus on the feeling of cold and try to really be aware of exactly what it feels like. And if I got into just the right state of like really trying to not label it, like like try to, to anytime my brain would say, ow, this is bad, this hurts, I want to go inside, I would kind of let those thoughts go. And I'd really try to focus on just the pure sensation. Like, what does this actually feel like? Let me not bring any of my kind of characterizations or conceptualizations to the feeling, but let's just like pay attention to the feeling. And then I would get these moments, you know, for three seconds or five seconds where the pain and suffering would separate and I'd be in intense pain. Like it'd be this extreme feeling of cold, but I wouldn't be suffering anymore. And then, you know, usually after like five seconds, I I would fall out of it and I'd be suffering again. I'm wondering, have you had that separation during your meditation? Yeah, I definitely have. There's also, um, again, I, I don't feel very informed on this, but I'm very interested in this, some research around sort of the, the, the development or the understanding of pain as a medical condition of itself. There was a time where pain was not even really like asked about in, in doctor's offices, like fairly recently, I think up until maybe like the eighties, it's just like, wasn't a very relevant, like doctors didn't say like, how much pain are you in? And now when you go to the doctor, there's also like a pain scale. People ask you like kind of scale of one to 10, how bad is your pain? And there's also, you know, conditions that we describe as like, okay, this person has chronic pain, like, like me. Whereas in the past, we just sort of viewed it as like, a passing sort of ephemeral experience that like may or may not have anything to do with, with the underlying condition. And so um, I think there's also this, like by giving pain a label and by like calling it something that you can have, I mean, I'm uncertain. And I think the research isn't there about like, are we just putting a label on something that people have always experienced? And like, now they're, you know, glad that we can research it and look at it at that, or have we like given something a name and then like, our brains have sort of developed a subjective experience around it. There's a pretty interesting podcast called The Fifth Vital Sign um, by Invisibilia about this, which is, yeah, talks about these categories of people who who feel this type of chronic pain and it's sort of unclear what the physical origin is, but um, talking very much about like how our identification with it can, can cause it to be um, felt differently. And in this podcast, they also touch on this sort of phenomena. There's a, there's a specific demographic group, which I also fit into of girls who start experiencing unexplained chronic pain in their early teens. And they tend to be like a similar archetype of sort of like high achiever girls who are, you know, rule abiding and high achieving and and usually yet academically successful who develop chronic pain around that age. So there's a lot of thoughts about like, where is this coming from? And could it come from like it being socially unacceptable for those girls to have like 
strong emotions or strong negative emotions. And then, you know, but it is acceptable to have a, a physical condition. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's just all sorts of like interesting stuff to pull apart there. And I'll be curious what the, what the research shows over the next few years. What was your experience like when the pain first started? Do you, do you remember? You said you were 11 years old. Yeah. I mean, it started in my wrists and I thought it was, um, yeah. I mean, I think we thought it was tendinitis and yeah, there were just suddenly some things I couldn't do. And yeah, then it gradually started to affect my my horn playing. Although um, I have to say that was sort of the last holdout because as you mentioned with flow states, that was the, the area where I was able to like most ignore it. And so that, that I was able to continue without um, actively perceiving the pain during horn playing until my early twenties. And then it kind of grew from there. Yeah. Well, it, it grew up until I would say my early twenties was sort of the peak of it. And I would say I've I don't know if it's less now, but it's 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 been at least stable, and I certainly have learned how to manage it better since then. And and I assume the doctors don't have an explanation for it, like they don't have like oh, the, you know, this is caused by X Y Z. Is that right? No, yeah, there's no. I mean, there's a the only diagnosis I have is descriptive. It's chronic myofascial pain syndrome, which is yeah, just descriptive. Not it's not explaining why it happened. I love how doctors give like these long technical words, to things that basically say, we don't know what's wrong with you, <laughs> but yeah, we're say it yeah. in Latin or, you know, like to make it sound yeah, exactly. more authoritative. <laughs> yeah. Not that that one's in Latin, but before we finish, is there anything you want to say to people who experience chronic pain? Like, you know, what would your advice be if this is the first time experiencing it? Like maybe they now have low back pain or something like that. Yeah. I had a doctor uh, who was my, a surgeon who operated on me and I, and I had a surg- surgery from him and it, it didn't help. In fact, made me a little bit worse. That was like kind of a downer. But he said something to me that I didn't really understand at the time, which was just like, well, you know, when I talk to my patients like five or 10 years after the surgery, they usually tell me like that somehow it, it got better. I don't know if he literally means like the pain got better, like their lives got better, their relationship with the pain got better. But yeah, I think it's, it's, um, yeah, it's just really astonishing, like what our mind can learn to do. And there's, and there's not like a straightforward way to learn it. Like some people recommend meditation, some people recommend I don't know, different types of like um, occupational therapy. There's all sorts of different ways to, again, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of alternative mes- medicine. And so I, yeah, I think with chronic pain, it's, it can be like not that straightforward to get an answer, but I think, you know, your brain can kind of figure out how to live a, a worthwhile life, even with a lot of pain. And, and you know, also in terms, surprisingly, like it, it might just get better by being able to relate to it differently. So there's a lot of yeah, unintuitive truths about pain that hopefully will become more intuitive as we learn more about the research. So even if you never figure out what causes it or you never get like a nice medical diagnosis that's satisfying, there's ways you can learn to live better and, and it might just get better on its own as well. Yeah. One other topic that, I mean, this is just kind of uh, not, not directly answering the question you just asked, but um, you know, because we've spent so much of this time talking about animal suffering, I think there's there's just all sorts of fascinating implications about where pain comes from and this difference, like as you mentioned, between like the actual physical stimulus and how we react to it and how that might have implications on on how animals suffer. Like there's some theories that like, of course, they might be like um, you know, very simply minded and therefore like not experience it as subjectively negative as we do, or they might, you know, have some sort of completely different framework. Like maybe it, it feels like it fits part of an evolutionary drive that is very strong for them fulfilling. But then there's other people who say that because um, some men- animals don't have the same mental faculties to like reason and understand things rationally, that they might be less able to cope with physical pain than humans are. And so, yeah, there's just a lot of interesting directions that that research can go. And I hope there will be a better understanding over time. There's a researcher named Adam Shriver who's doing some interesting research in this area. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, the philosophical question of what is pain like to animals and does, does the reduced ability to have advanced cognitions, does that make pain better or worse? Uh, it's a really interesting question. Leah, thank you so much for coming on. This was a really fascinating conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to chat with you. Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by Janessa Barill. Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. To find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com. And if you like the show, we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. 
We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. You can sign up for that newsletter on our website, clearerthinkingpodcast.com. A listener asks, what's the most helpful hack you've found for motivation, either from your own life or in the life of somebody else you know that has struggled with motivation? I think there's different levels of motivation. There's like the micro motivation, like, oh man, I really should be working on that project, but like, I really don't feel like doing it right now. And for that, I find a couple things work really well. One is just making a plan with someone else to say, okay, I'm avoiding something. Why don't we both meet? And then you can work on something you're avoiding. I can work on something I'm avoiding. So I have a regular like weekly meeting with my research assistant, Claire. And what we do in those meetings is I'm only allowed to work on things that are the sort of thing that I like tend to put off. (laughs) And so uh, really, really what they are is the sort of projects that are like important, but never urgent. So there's never like a deadline. So I always just put other things important in front of them. So that's really useful. Another thing that I find can really help in that kind of micro motivation is by like making a deal with myself. I'm like, okay. What if you go do this now for 20 minutes and then you get to do this really fun thing after or something like that? And I find that that can like increase my motivation level. Then there's the sort of larger scale motivation of like, how do you motivate yourself to like stick with something over the long term? And there I find the social thing can be really useful too. Like by involving another person in the project who I know is not the sort of person who's going to give up, that is really motivating for me. That may not work for everyone, but for me, that's like a magical life hack of like having another person who's like, going to be like, okay, Spencer, I need this thing from you. Or like, let's push this forward. And then like, I'm going to stick with it and it will keep regenerating my motivation. And then the second thing there, I think is just in project selection, making sure to choose projects where you're really, really excited about the thing that you're going to be creating. And so like that end state is like very, very motivating to you. Obviously you don't always have control over that. You know, all kinds of things are going to interfere and all kinds of things are going to determine what you can focus on and what your projects are. But insofar as you do have a choice, trying to pick stuff where like the end state of the project is actually super exciting and motivating to you. And so then you can try to keep reminding yourself of that when your motivation starts to flag.